All right, people, it's a new day. We got a new whiteboard. We are going to look at the guard position, the offensive guard, two of them. Um, you know, looking at uh, this roster right now, this Seahawks roster, can't really address left tackle right now. So we're going to skip over that. Like it or not, Dwayne Brown has two years left on his contract, and he's still a really good player. So he's going to be the left tackle in 2020, I think, pretty much no matter what. So there's no point in addressing that. We're going to go over to guard. We're going to look at both guard spots at once. So let's start by taking a look at what we have. Because once you see what we have, you might understand why this could be a problem. So uh, the current slate of offensive guards on this roster who have actually shown signs of maybe being part of the team next year in terms of meaningful contributions. We have Jamarco Jones. He looked okay for a few games at guard. Clearly not really cut out to be a tackle. Ethan Posick, uh, it seems like he should probably be playing center. Doesn't seem like he has much going for him as a guard. We've seen that movie a few times now and it doesn't end well. Uh, we got Phil Haynes, who I like. I think he's the future. Uh, draft pick last year and played a little bit in the playoff game against the Packers, and I liked what I saw, but it's a small sample size. And we got DJ Fluke over here, who's, um, he's cheap, right? I mean, we're getting what we're paying for, and you can't say that he sucks at everything. He's just can't stay healthy, can't pass block, slow. You know, th there are some real problems when DJ Fluke is your starting guard. So that's what we got. Um, and then we have one decision to make. Free agent to be Mike Upati. Keep or let go. I like Upati. I think he brought some thing, good things to the table this year. He was great in run blocking. You can honestly say that Mike Upati was our best run blocker last year. And, you know, we didn't have a great rushing attack last year, but there were games where we had a really good one, and he sprung a lot of our big running plays last year. So... He's old, he's injury prone, he can't stay healthy, he is due to fall off a cliff any day now. I can go either way, it doesn't make that much of a difference to me, but we should not be going into 2020 expecting Mike Upati to start or play 16 games or anything like that, right? If we bring him back, it should probably be as depth, right? A veteran backup. He, he's just not good enough to start anymore, and even when you do have him, you can't really depend on him to actually stick around very long. So I wrote down, you could probably bring him back for one year and just under $3 million. It might be less. He took two and 2.75 last year. It might go down. He's only getting older. <coughs> I don't know. I don't know how the league is going to view Mike Upati, because when he played last year, he was actually pretty good. And yeah, he's going to be 33 next year, so betting on Mike Upati... You don't want to do that. Uh, there are a couple other guys, Demetrius Knox, but we have no idea what he is yet, and we can't depend on him for a thing yet. Um, if he pans out, great, but I don't think it's going to happen in 2020. And we have Jordan Roos, who's a free agent, but I don't think anything of Jordan Roos. And then we have Jordan Simmons, who's actually kind of interesting, but I don't even know if he's still on this team, guys. I haven't seen him in like a year and a half. I haven't seen him in a long time, so... Guard situation right now is, it's a problem, okay? So, are we going to address it in free agency? Maybe. Let, let's go down this list here. I found five free agent guards that kind of caught my attention, and for, for different reasons. So, I'm going to start Ron Leary from Denver. This, I just put him here because we need at least one option like this, but... Ronald Leary is the guy we would get if we just go, we want a Band-Aid, but we don't trust Upati for whatever reason, right? We don't want it to be Upati, because Ron Leary is, to me, kind of the same thing. He gets hurt a lot. He's not the same guy. Um, you know, Denver gave him a ton of money, gave him that big contract, and there were he had good years. He did have some good seasons for them, but he's clearly past his prime, clearly lost something. Even when he played in Denver last year, he was not good. So this, to me, is just a Band-Aid. Like, hey, we need somebody to fill in for a year while we figure out what we're doing for the long term. I think you could get him for a year and five mil, just a little more than Upati, just because uh, he's coming off such a big contract. I don't think he's going to step down to, like, a two mil deal. But uh, it's hard to know with these guys. 
he's going to be 31 at the start of next season. So he's not that old yet, but he's clearly lost something. I don't like this one, but I got to put him out there because we need to have one Band-Aid option like that. Uh, next name I have here is BJ Finney. I think you could get him for about three years, 18. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I skipped the biggest one. I can't skip this guy, Brandon Scherf. This is the guy who would actually get people excited. This guy would alter the equation. This guy would change the team. He's a franchise level guard. And I know, you know, you don't really build your franchise around a guard, but if you did, this is one of the guys you would do it around. He's one of the best guards in the league. He's shook, he's shucking available. He's out there. Somebody's going to get him. If it's us, it's going to cost a little something. Four years, 50 million is his market, I think. 29 years old, so the four-year deal is totally workable. The money is a little hairy, especially when you're just talking about one guard. But if we got Scherf, that would, in my opinion, permeate throughout the entire offensive line and possibly allow us to go a little cheaper at a couple other positions on the offensive line. You know, if we had Scherf starting at right guard, I would be totally fine with Phil Haynes starting at left guard. But if our right guard is DJ Fluker, then I need an upgrade over Haynes just so we have some a killer in there, you know? But yeah, Brandon Scherf, he's the break the bank option. So I think his market is going to be four years, 50 million. And, you know, it's worth it. Uh, next name, BJ Finney. These next three guys are all kind of the same in terms of their, like, mid-level options. They're good. You're not crazy about it. You're not excited about it. You're going to sign him for a few years. You're going to have to give him a little bit of money. But you're getting reasonably decent guard labor. So BJ Finney, three years, $18 million. He's 28. Age is not a concern. This guy of these three is my favorite, uh, Andrews Pete from the uh, Saints. He's going to cost a little bit more because he's younger. I think three years, $21 million, but he's only 26, so he might get better. He might not have hit his ceiling yet. So I like Andrews Pete. If we go to free agency in terms of like a cost versus risk evaluation, Pete might be my favorite. <clears throat> and then the last guy is Quentin Spain. This guy is like one level up from Ronald Leary. It's not a Band-Aid, but it's not exactly going to stay very long if it gets wet either, you know? Two years, $10 million. He's 29. He's just trying to get one last decent-sized contract before he gets too old to do anything like that. I think all three of these guys are reasonable, decent options. You're not crazy about any of them. They're just middle-class players. All right, so that's free agency. I'll say I'm not really jumping out of my seat to sign any of these guys when you look at how much it'll cost versus how much it'll affect the team. I feel like you can do better when you look at, you know, cost versus uh, reward in the draft. So we're going to take a look there. What are some options for us in the draft if we if we decide to address our guard problems there? So I listed nine guys that caught my attention, that I liked, what I heard about, what I read about. There's definitely some guys out there that could have been included here that um, I just haven't heard about or they didn't catch my attention for some random reason. So don't take this as definitive at all. But here's some guys. Number one, we have Shane Lemieux from Oregon, Pac-12 guy. He's the best guard in this draft by pretty much any evaluation. He's a good run blocker, good pass blocker. He has a lot of experience at Oregon. He's a great all-around guard prospect, 6'4 and almost 320. So he is not too big, not too small. He's quick for a guard, runs a 5140, which is the fastest 40 time I found for any guard this draft. So he's just got everything going for him, man. Now, if we want him, we will probably have to spend our first round pick. At best, we'll have to spend our second round pick. He's going to go in the first or second round. I would say probably top of top of the second is most likely, <clears throat> but uh, we would, I mean, you know, stranger things have happened. You know, we can trade up, but he's an option. Uh, number two, Solomon Kindley from Georgia. He's the other big guard prospect in this draft, I think. Similar size, but he's a little tubbier. And I have heard that he does need to lose some weight because he's playing a little heavy right now, and that's hurting him against the pass rushes that he's playing against. But 
Other than that, he's a rock-solid prospect. Everything that Shane Lemieux is, Solomon Kinley is as well. There's just a little bit of concern about his weight and a little bit of concern about how he's going to play against like speed rushers. But he's a guy who should go in the second round, maybe the third round. So we could possibly get him at the end of the third. More than likely, we would have to move up a little bit mid-third, high-third. Uh, this next guy might be my favorite in terms of value, uh, Logan Stenberg from Kentucky. And the one thing I will say is that the one thing I don't like about this guy, the one thing that alarms me a little bit, is that he looks like he's more of a run blocker. And with the offense that I want to build, I want pass blockers. But that's not the offense that we're building. We have an offense that is probably going to be run first for the foreseeable future, so we have to get the right players to run that. So, Logan Stenberg from the Kentucky, six foot six, so he's tall, uh, 320 pounds, about 5.3540. He's got a mean streak. He just dominates his matchups in the trenches. I think this guy might be the steal of the draft in terms of guard. I think if you get him, he might be the lowest graded guard who can start from day one because Lemieux and Kinley are expected to start day one. Stenberg, I feel like, can start day one as well. Again, I don't love the fact that it seems like he has some holes in his game when it comes to pass blocking, but in terms of value and in terms of maybe replacing a guy like DJ Fluker and giving us another guard who has a mean streak, I like it. Uh, next name is the other Oregon guard, Calvin Throckmorton. He's another quick guard. He's 6'5 and almost 320, but he runs a 5.1240. So Oregon, they're turning out those quick moving guards. <clears throat> for Who knows why, but I think that's kind of cool. Um, he, we could get maybe in the fourth round. As you can see, he's projected to go somewhere in the third round or the fourth round. And um, I'm not overly crazy about this, I'll say this, but it needs to be said, Throckmorton might be able to play some tackle in the NFL. Now, I don't really like that because to me, when you have a guard who can play tackle in the NFL, they usually don't pass block very well because they're not used to having to move laterally that much, but you never know when a little versatility is going to save your ass. So uh, Calvin Throckmorton might be an emergency tackle or something like that. So a little bit of versatility, something to think about. All right, so the rest of these are kind of the bargain bin, roll the dice, flip the coin, uh, gamble with a low low round pick um, options. Damian Lewis from LSU, he's 6'3", 322 pounds, runs a 5'3", 40, and you can get him anywhere from the fourth round to the sixth round. He was, I think, a three-year starter at LSU. Uh, again, he's another guy who, when I look at him, I say he's probably more of a run blocker than a pass blocker. But <clears throat> um, it seems like he's pretty good at that. Uh, next name is John Molchan from uh, Boise State University, BSU. Uh, he's pretty big, 6'5", 320 pounds, runs a 5'240", which is actually, uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry, a 5.4540, and you can get him in that same range, fourth round to sixth round. Sorry, guys, my lines are pretty uh, tight together here. And he is another guy who might be able to play a little bit of tackle in uh, the NFL. I'm not, again, I don't want to go crazy about that, but a little versatility sometimes can help. All right, so that's John Mulchin from BSU. Next name is Dyshawn Dixon from San Diego State University. I mean... Um, you know, San Diego State University has turned out some pretty good running backs in the last few years. So you got to figure Dyshawn Dixon is part of the reason why every year SDSU has one of the most prolific rushing attacks in football. So 6'5", 320, 5'2", so he's quick and he's big, he's tall. Another guy, 4th to 6th. Not a bad idea to take a flyer there. Uh, last two names, and these guys might go undrafted. This is the bottom of the draft barrel, but got to take some shots on some guys late in the draft, right? So we have Natane Muti, FSU. He's kind of small for a guard. 6'3", 307 pounds, but he's quick. He runs the 5'2", 40. And <clears throat> this is the ultimate gamble because 
this dude can't stay healthy at all. In college, he barely played. If he did get to play in college, if he stayed healthy, very good chance that he's like a top three round pick. Very good chance that he would have been a top 60 pick. But didn't happen. And now he might not even get drafted. But uh, I think there's some real potential here to be a steal. If he can stay healthy in the NFL, I think he could really be something. So that's kind of what I'm into in terms of taking a gamble late in the draft. Get somebody who has a lot of upside and a lot of downside. And you can live with the downside because it's a sixth round pick. Last name I'm going to go over is Tommy Kramer from Notre Dame. He's 6'5", 314, so nice size, pretty quick, 5.2940, and he's projected to go in the seventh round. So if we got him, it would probably be with our last pick, damn near Mr. Irrelevant. Um, so yeah, that that's my evaluation. There were some other guards who were highly touted in this draft who I kind of sort of stumbled over because there was some theme about them that I didn't like, but uh, there are certainly, there's a guy from Michigan who people are kind of high on. Uh, I think there's a guy from Wisconsin that people are high on. So y'all are going to have to go out there and make your own uh, assessments. But this is kind of what I like. My ideal offseason for addressing the guard spot would be, I, th I think if, if you gave me the option, I would give the left guard job, the left guard starting job to Phil Haynes because I really like him. And I want to give him a chance. And I, at the very least, I think he can be solid. Maybe he won't be great, but I think he can be solid. And then I would give the right guard spot to Logan Stenberg, who we draft in the second round. I would spend our second round pick on Logan Stenberg, and that would be that. And then we would have um, Jamarco Jones as a backup. Maybe DJ Fluker would be a backup because he's so cheap. There's not much of a point in cutting him. Um, we can bring back Upati on a super cheap deal if we want to, but I don't think it matters, and he would be a backup. That would kind of be my perfect. And I want to I would probably want to take another guard late, like Muti or Kramer in the sixth round or the seventh round. If we got one of those two guys in the sixth or seventh, I'd be happy, just because I feel like this is a position where we need to take a lot of shots, because we can get better at both sides. I mean, even though I'm fine with Philip Haynes being the dude at left guard for now, I think we can do better, and I think we need to try to do better at both spots if possible. But we have other needs. We can't spend all of our assets on guards. Um, some people have been strongly advocating for bringing in a Brandon Scherf to play at right guard. If we did that, then we wouldn't need to spend a draft pick on Logan Stenberg because Scherf would be taking care of our problems for years. So I'm open to that as well. But to reiterate, my perfect offseason, the offseason that I would like to see here, give Phil Haynes the starting job, go draft Logan Stenberg in the second round, put him at right guard, go get me one of these you know, high upside, high risk, high bust potential guys in the sixth and seventh round like Muti or Kramer, and then roll out next season with that. Maybe you cut Fluker to make room for Muti or Kramer. Maybe you cut maybe you cut Posick. I don't know. Maybe Posick moves to center. I don't know. But uh, that's kind of what I would like to see. What would you guys like to see? What do you think? Is there somebody I left out here? Is there somebody you'd like to trade for? Maybe you could trade for a good guard. I don't know. But this is what I like. These are the guys who caught my attention. I mean, if we wanted to spend, like, if if we get to our pick in the second round and Shane Lemieux is somehow there, I'm all over that. Holy shit, I'm all over that. Solomon Kinley, too, possibly. I don't think that's going to happen. I would even be okay with trading up a little bit to get one of those two guys. But realistically, I think those two guys are going to be gone, so Stenberg's my guy. You could even maybe get Stenberg in the third round, by the way, which would be, whoo. I would get excited for that. All right, peace out, go Hawks. Next video, we're going to be talking about the center position. We're going to be talking about centers. And if you know me, you know that I think center is the biggest, the biggest thing this offense needs to address before the season. All right, see you later.